The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.org. So with that, it is time for our educational presentation. I'm going to ask Patty Smith to come up here and introduce our speaker while I fiddle with the PC and hopefully get it ready. So, Thank you, Tony. And welcome everyone to our Veterans Day program. I am super excited about talking and learning about uh, the veterans program that our speaker will be sharing today. Our speaker is retired, decorated Captain Catherine K. Bauer of the United States Navy. Kay grew up with her 13 brothers and sisters in St. Paul. She earned her four-year nursing degree from the College of St. Catherine in Minnesota. With St. Catherine's nursing degree in hand, Kay entered the Navy. She anticipated just a two-year stint, but that turned into a 35-year career, during which she earned the rank of captain. Kay served at bases in the United States, Guam, Japan, and Vietnam. She was part of the forward surgical team assigned to the Vietnam Providential Hospital in the southernmost part of South Vietnam. Kay was instrumental in forming the nurses PTSD support group and is fondly referred to as the Admiral by her sister veterans. Kay now lives in Coon Rapids, Minnesota with her husband, Vern. She has six wonderful grandchildren and two really great sons and, and daughters-in-law. You can listen to Kay in an interview called The Voices of Minnesota it's a collection from oral histories at the Minnesota Historical Society. Please help me welcome this morning, Captain Kay Bauer. Thank you and good morning. What an honor to be invited to talk with you fantastic people who are and have been the movers and shakers and leaders in the world of genealogy. Thank you. I would like to share with you some withdrawals from my memory bank. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, my ancestors and relatives who served in the military. My great uncle Frank served in World War I in the U.S. Army. He was very highly decorated. He served in the trenches in France and died from the mustard gas poisoning in France a few years after returning home. And uh, <clears throat> this is my Uncle Frank uh, with one of his awards. My Uncle Gerald served in World War II with the U.S. Army. He served in the Pacific area as a medic. Uncle Easton served in the U.S. Army. He was highly decorated. He served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, in the Pacific and South Korea, Cambodia, and South Vietnam. He served there very early in the 50s when he was told, of course, if anything happens to you, we do not know you. Um, my brothers served, three of my brothers served in the military. My brother Jim served in the Air Force, and my brother Joe served in the Army, and my brother Jerry served in the Minnesota Army National Guard. My nephews, all highly decorated. John served in the U.S. Navy Air in the Pacific. Jerome served in the U.S. Navy in the submarines in the Pacific. Todd in the Marine Corps, Embassy Guard during Desert Storm, Ray, U.S. Army, Point Man in Iraq, Rick, U.S. Army, Command Sergeant Major, five tours, Iraq, Kurt, now serving in the U.S. Navy as a Chief Petty Officer in charge of supplies aboard a um, CDA. Um, aircraft carrier. My goal in life was to be an educator in the mission field. 
Somehow, I got directed into nursing during my third year at St. Catherine's University. Oops, that meant I needed a fifth year for which there are no loans or scholarships. Fortunately, a friend at the university invited me to join her to visit the military who did have scholarships. We both joined the Navy who paid our room and board and tuitions, all of our fees and a monthly salary for our last year at the universities. By late 1965, I had been in the Navy almost eight years. During that time, I had been in charge of the education department at three hospitals and in charge of pediatric, surgical, medical, nursery, orthopedic, and numerous other wards, along with hospital supervision and development of many programs. I had now decided to fulfill my goal in life and had accepted a position as director of, school, of a school of nursing in the mission post. When I told my nursing service director of my decision to resign my commission to do this, she asked if I would go to Vietnam with a seven-member forward surgical team. When I reminded her that I am not an OR nurse, she insisted that I, if I had been in the Navy that long, I certainly could serve with a surgical team. In Vietnam in 19... 66 to 67, hmm. I was not certain I wanted to go. However, it seems that two members of the team were friends of mine, Bev, an OR nurse instructor, who had graduated from five years of nursing at a prestigious university in London at the end of World War II, and Don, a doctor who had just completed his surgical residency and for whom I had helped in an emergency situa situation. After they both asked me to go, I decided to do so. When I called home to inform my parents, my mother said that she was happy if that was what I wanted. My father, however, said something I cannot repeat here about a war going on over there, and was I in my right mind. Bev, Don, and I flew to D.C. to meet with our other four team members. Naturally, we, after we got there was a blizzard, and so no mo vehicles were moving in the D.C. area. We trudged through ankle-deep snow about two miles across the bridge from Virginia to D.C., our CO, Francis, was an orthopedic surgeon. He had served in the Royal Air Force as a pilot in England during World War II. After marrying a U.S. Army nurse and coming to the U.S., he became an orthopedic surgeon and was commissioned a Navy commander a week before we met. A Navy Chief Bill, who was a lab and x-ray technician expert, Bill, an Air Force male nurse anesthetist, and, and since none of us spoke Army, we would and we would be in an Army area caring for mostly Army personnel and requiring supplies from the Army, we had an Army administration officer who could handle, handle the army for us. We were what is now called a purple service unit, purple suit unit, unit comprised of all services. And we were off to Vietnam, excuse me. And Saigon awaiting final orders that hurry up and wait time with which we military personnel are so familiar. First, the Army insisted we had to be outfitted with gear necessary for those in combat area. Wow, 65 pounds of bandoliers of ammo. <coughs> Excuse me. And knives and entrenching tools and uniforms, etc. So at the end of the line, with an M14 piled onto my, at that time, 100-pound body, I toppled over. 
Then a Navy nurse friend, the surgical team we were relieving in Rakia, somehow managed to contact me on one of those contact crank phones that if you've ever watched MASH or anything like that, you understand what I'm talking about. She said, this is Mary calling from Rock. Yeah, where you will be working. And I said, what? Oh, so good to hear from you. And she said, Kay, just listen. My CEO said to contact you, and you are to tell your CEO that we will be gone when you get here. And I said, why isn't your CEO calling my CEO? Well, he knew that I met, knew you, and he said, well, you call. Goodbye. Well, our CEO was not a happy camper, even less so when we arrived in the Rock yeah, airstrip. It was empty. The small airport building was empty. Our C-130 dropped us on the bare airstrip and took off, and there we were. During more hurry up and wait time, now there we were standing with not a person or a vehicle in sight amidst rice paddies and palm We weren't afraid, ha. Huh? <laughs> Eventually, someone at the hospital who had seen the plane land and rapidly take off came to get us. Naturally, the CO and the XO went first, and we had to wait. Uh, in Rakia, yeah, we were to provide surgical and medical care, as well as technical training for a large Army radio unit, Navy swift boat units, and when their planes were shelled, Air Force personnel who parachuted out and could be found in the rare forested area surrounding us. Since we were seven could not alone set up and run a hospital, the Department of Defense had arranged for us to use the Vietnamese Provincial Hospital. In return, <coughs> excuse me, when not busy with U.S. troops, we would provide surgery for Vietnamese military and civilian patients. There were no screw screens on the louvered windows at the provincial hospital. At night, four poster wooden slat beds with wood woven palm tree mats were covered with netting to avoid the mosquito. There was no running water. Large cement cisterns around the hospital filled with rain during monsoon seasons. These had spigots at the bottom to get the water. We set up a water distillery for use in the operating room since Bev knew how to set up a distillery. I thought maybe we could make one for gin, but Bev said no. There was no electricity. Our only source of power was one generator in the OR. The hospital daily menu was fresh fruit, fresh fish, and rice, and fresh vegetables cooked over a fireplace. Care of patients <clears throat> was provided by family, not the nurses. Because of no screens, no electricity, no running water, no nursing care, etc. Our motto for wounded, wounded Americans was treat, triage, treat, and then transport to the Saigon Army Hospital several hours away to transport our wounded warriors when they were not otherwise deployed. We used either the Army or Air Force two-seater planes on the short tarmac near the hospital. Our Rocky yeah, living quarters was to be in a wooden house across a narrow dirt road from the hospital. Bev and I, the only women on the team, were allotted a tiny loft reached by climbing a rickety staircase. The room was big enough for us to squeeze in between two wooden slat beds and a small chest of drawers. We slept atop the slats, had a piece of wood as a pillow, and a mosquito netting draped from the posters. Living with five men 
<clears throat> was not our cup of tea. We soon found and moved to another house several blocks away. Excuse me. <laughs> Our abode, like the hospital, had no running water, electricity, or screening. Above a cistern in our kitchen, a hole in the ceiling allowed collection of monsoon rain. To prevent other than water dropping in, we finally covered the hole with some reappropriated screening. We never stole anything. More, more from my memory bank. A U.S. Army captain advisor had procured a movie, a projector, and a generator. He asked us to please view this with him at the Army base in the next village. Two of us commandeered a vehicle. We had, once we moved to a new house, Bev and I, the, um, so, um, uh, This other organization in Washington sent two other nurses who were civilians down to work with us. And so we had two other nurses who were civilians working with us there. And so one of them went with me and we commandeered a beer vehicle, and while we were engrossed in the movie at this Arvin base in the next village, we suddenly realized that it was late and dark outside. Oops. As we sl sped to our quarters past outpost sentries between the villages, we so hoped that we they remembered us. In wartime, you, you're not supposed to be out after dark outside of your, your abodes. The other nurse knew I was Catholic, so she said, you drive. Where is your rosary so I can pray? Returning safely, our crank phone was buzzing. The hospital was calling to say that the building that we where we had been watching the movie had been blown up. Just after we left, survivors were arriving. I have so many stories to tell about our brave men and the Vietnamese people. Due to no electricity, our hospital closed down at sundown with patients cared for the family, as always in third world countries, unless they were among the wealthy who could bring their servants. Many have asked how I celebrated Christmas. Since we did not have wards of American servicemen in our hospital in the closed hospital closed at dark, we did not have a celebration at the hospital, and the ser the army ser had their own services together at their barracks. <laughs> I am Catholic, so I was able to celebrate Midnight Mass outside under the sparkling stars in the area adjacent to the church. It was so beautiful and wonderful to have that hour of respite. And my year sped by. Hearing my orders had arrived and I was going home to Minnesota, several sergeants, I'm not good with Army ranks, so I called everybody Sarge. They came with an envelope containing names and phone numbers. Al wanted me to call his mom in northern Minnesota, and would I call Matt's wife in Fargo and Ron's girl in Hudson and several others? Of course, I tucked the envelope safely away. My uniform gear was packed and civvies donned due to anti-war protests, we were forewarned not to have anything showing that indicated we were military. The flight to Travis Air Force Base, the lone taxi ride to the airport, and boarding the last plane for home raced by like an illusion. 
After several days of homecoming celebrations with family and friends, I remembered the sergeant's envelope. Al's mom was first. Amid my excited chatting about seeing Al seven, several days before, she began to cry. Army officers had come several mornings before with the news that no one at home wanted to hear. After expressing my condolences and hanging up, I silently wept, then slowly shredded the envelope and names. My next duty was Quantico Naval Hospital for the Marines, many returning from tours in Vietnam. Then the Navy sent me to duty in Minnesota. Now I was home for real on recruiting duty. I was kept busy recruiting nurses from the surrounding five states. I talked with them and their families and sometimes on radio or TV about the military, the Navy, and the Vietnam War, which seemingly loomed endlessly. One morning, my phone rang. It was my CO said, stay home. The federal office building in downtown Minneapolis, including my office, had been blown off. Several months later, a friend came to my Shoreview home to watch a special 10 p.m. Navy movie on TV. As the film was announced, I heard a terrible explosion as I leaped behind the sofa and shrieked, stay inside. My friend, of course, ran out. Stumbling back in, she screamed that the home next door was on fire, had collapsed, and it was raining debris outside. <clears throat> then we finally went outside in our ropes, and it was utter chaos. The entire area was covered with police, fire personnel, neighbors, and friends from miles away. The fire slowly diminished, yet smoke and shards of metal and glass and wood endlessly spewed everywhere. Mercifully, those in that home had been asleep when they were killed in the explosion. My neighbor on the other side was a volunteer fireman, and so he had, after hearing the explosion, he had gone and gotten the fire department there. Suddenly, my shoulder was tapped, and a boy said, are you Commander Bauer? I turned. Two men in suits, white shirts, and ties stood there. Bewildered, I said, well, who wants to know? A metal shield with some writing, writing on it was held out, and he said, we are ONI that's now known as NCIS. Basically, they said, sell your home, move, no longer, no longer wear a uniform or drive a Navy car home. Why? Oh, and I said they believed that those planting the plastic explosives in my neighbor's home somehow got, got the wrong address. While investigators later assured neighbors that a gas leak caused this, the newspaper article from the gas company the next day insisted that gas had not yet been installed in our area. Hmm. Another memory. In 1984, Diane Carlson Evans, a former Army nurse who had served in Vietnam, gathered Minnesota nurses who were in-country Vietnam veterans. She wanted a memorial in D.C. to commemorate women who had served there. Those of us who are able are so excited to be going to D.C. this 11 November 2023 weekend for the 30th anniversary of the Vietnam Women's Memorial dedication. My eldest son and daughter-in-law, one of my six sisters, a niece, and a sister-in-law will accompany me. And by Diane Evans, 
healing wounds of Vietnam War combat nurses' tenure fight to win women, women a place in honor in Washington, D.C., she will be the keynote speaker. So as our group of nurses were in-country Vietnam veterans continued to meet, we began to realize we needed help. The VA, not yet accustomed to working with women veterans in any number, directed us to a social worker in an outbuilding near the old VA hospital, where all Vietnam vets were sent for assistance. Several World War II nurses joined us as they said that when they returned home, they were encouraged to not talk about anything they did or had seen during their four years of dedicated service with none or only a few days off during that four years. They were so excited that we would just listen to their stories. We were so thrilled to hear from them and appalled what they had suffered along with those they had served during World War II. We, of course, knew that we did not have PTSD. You know, we were just nurses and we weren't in combat. It took a long time to accept that, yes, we did have PTSD. Because of working with these tremendous women, I now belong to many groups working with women veterans. Though independent, we are assisted by the VA, including a group especially addressing the issues of younger women veterans with suicide prevention, homelessness, drug and alcohol abuse, joblessness, and single parenting. One of the programs this Women Veterans Initiative started was one indicating that we do not recognize women as veterans. The We Are Not Invisible campaign was initiated. The book was written. Another about women Minnesota veterans is Sisterhood of War. Many of us Minnesota women veterans are battle buddies and sister of sisters. This means that if veterans ask the VA Medical Center Volunteer Office, we meet the veteran at the VA and help them to find departments, answer questions, go in with their appointments to take notes and assist, and assist them in remembering their concerns. We then review all with them and give them the notes to take home. Because of our and many others' efforts, the Minneapolis VA is now among the top in the nation in helping women and men. These were some withdrawals from my memory bank. Thank you to all for listening. Thank you so much, Captain K. That was amazing. What great memories that you shared with us. And I would also like to recognize any of the veterans here in our audience and those out in our um, that are viewing through Zoom. We just want to thank you. And my, I just want to say, too, that my dad was a um, Matt, retired master sergeant from the United States Air Force and served for nine months in Vietnam. So I um, really respect those of you men and women who have served and want to thank you so much for what you have done for our country and your dedication. So thank you very much. I want to ask if there might be any questions uh, here in the audience or uh, on in our Zoom meeting. If you have any questions for Kay, I am so thrilled, Kay, that you continued your um, service by um, creating and, and being part of a group of women that are honoring our women veterans. And I know there's many, many additional programs throughout the United States, and I, I appreciate what you have done. So any other, any comments, any questions on our uh, from our Zoom audience. We had a heartfelt uh, thank you from Patricia Wolford. Uh, thank you very much, Captain. And uh, she said that she was uh, an Army nurse in Vietnam 
in the second surgical hospital in 65 through 66. So wow. Patricia, if you want to unmute yourself and tell a little bit more about uh, your story or questions that you might have for the captain. Uh, captain, it was wonderful to hear your presentation. We had a lot of similar situations and experiences, but then our uh, many that were different too, because I was in the Central Highlands, which was up further north and um, supporting the 1st Cavalry Division. So, um, you know, I understand a lot of what you went through. We also treated uh, Vietnam or uh, Vietnamese um, civilians and, um, you know, many uh, service, mostly Army, some um, Marine and other service, and uh, also some POWs. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for your service and for everything that you've done during the um, the period of time that you were in the service and, and what you're doing afterward. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your service. I appreciate that. I, I got to um, uh, appreciate the Army nurses uh, so very much when uh, when I got together with Diane Carlson Evans and the other um, Army nurses here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm the token Navy always. There aren't a lot of Navy nurses up here in in uh, in the Minnesota area, we do have a group, but um, uh, the Army nurses are the ones that were our Vietnam vets, and I I have heard their stories. and uh, And the World War II nurses were Army nurses, and um, uh, just uh, to hear their stories really humbles me. Thank you very much. All right. And do we have any other comments, any other feedback we can give to Captain K? I think they really enjoyed it. And I see the comments on the chat. Um, it, inspiring story. Thanking you for, um, for coming today and sharing your story with us. So we appreciate you very much. And I'm going to turn this over to Tony uh, for any um um, closing comments. All right. Thank you again very much. Uh, I just want to remind you that we're going to be meeting at a different location next month. So don't come here and we'll see you then. Also be interested in your feedback on this. We've uh, would greatly appreciate those of you that have participated, letting us know what you think about this and any presentation we have and would appreciate you know, any comments about that and what we should do in the future. Again, thank you very much for being here and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. Your fees have been supporting these and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, please consider joining now. Go to dallasgenealogy.org and click on the membership tab.